Good day. Today, we will try to look at how we are going to process the data that we have. We will talk about analyzing qualitative data. This is because the analyzing quantitative data will necessitate a very specialized type of skill which is research statistics and is often at this point delegated to the task of the uh, statistician than of the researcher. But coding is different because coding will necessitate the researcher's understanding of the different concepts in the study and not only understanding it, but also applying this understanding in the generation of data. So quantitative data analysis and interpretation. Data analysis refers to the attempt by the researcher to summarize collected data. In a way, this is a form of systematizing multiple data. Data interpretation will constitute the attempt to find meaning and or to put a story in the different data sets that we have. How do these differ by research tradition. In quantitative data or in quantitative research, data is analyzed first by identifying the type of measure that is involved in the research. Thus, knowledge of whether the data is nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio can help the researcher understand what appropriate statistical tools can be employed in the process. Qualitative data, therefore, uh, in analysis will necessitate not just the determination of the measure, but also the selection of the appropriate statistical tools in order to process the data set. Interpretation along those lines will necessitate cross-checking the data in terms of its fellow indicators, but also at the same time corroborating data with existing literatures as well as counter-literatures. Qualitative data, on the other hand, will necessitate a process of chunking, clustering, thematizing. In the same way that it will involve encoding data and thereby uh, also uh, interpreting data in the system of triangulation or using a system of triangulation where three different sources of data are put together analyzed and understood. So analysis is not left until the end. In fact, as you gather data, as you collect data, your analysis, we can say, have already begun. To avoid collecting data that are not important, the researcher must constantly ask himself, how is this data going to help me answer the question? Or better yet, when you pay attention to what your respondents or your interviewee uh, interviews would give you, you always need to ask yourself, how am I going to make sense of this data? As you collect data, you must always ask yourself, why do the participants behave as they do? What does these focus mean? 
or interest mean? What else do I want to know that is helpful in answering my question? What new ideas have emerged that the literature didn't say or that I was not able to even consider? Or to inquire whether the idea that is being pushed forward is in fact a new information. When the collector of the data constantly asks or inquires into how the data that he's hearing or gathering can make sense in relation to the statement of the problem, we are able to constantly gather data that are relevant to our problem. But data analysis can also follow after collection. One way is to follow three iterative steps. First, we become familiar with the data through reading and memoing. Of course, the presumption here is that interview scripts and the like are transcribed and therefore are available to us to be read and memoed. Second, after we have transcribed and memoed interview scripts, we examine the data in depth to consider detailed descriptions of the setting, of the participants, and of the activities, or better yet, to organize these data in accordance with the important themes in the study as they are dictated or guided by the statement of the problem. Thus, the third case, categorizing and coding pieces of data and grouping them into themes. It is not always true that there are unknown themes in a qualitative research or that the themes will only emerge after data gathering. What must be emphasized is the fact that because of the theory-driven nature of the research process, data will always be read, evaluated, and approached following the conceptual and theoretical framework of the study, which is laid more explicitly in the review of related literature. Data analysis after collecting and summarizing. The first time you sit down with your data is the only time you come to that particular set fresh. There is truth to that quotation by Kratovol, whether we like it or not. After we have read the data once, we need to always read it over and over and over and over and over and over again until we have exhausted all that is needed in order for us to answer our study, our questions. Thus, reading and memoing, we need to read, write memos about our interview scripts, our, about our field notes, about what we have gathered, FGD's document analysis. We need to constantly describe how the in KII, FGD, or even the document actually experienced uh, the questions, but also as participant observers, for example, we become a source of the data set. And in fact, one of the valid triangulated data gather triangulation data gathering method, participant observation. Thus, we develop a comprehensive description of the dimensions not just limited to a particular data gathering tool. So 
in the system of triangulation, it's very important to understand that there need to be always three different sources of data, thus triangulation. However, these different sources of data cannot simply be that, a source of data. Triangulation requires every qualitative researcher to actually allow these multiple sources of data and the data that was gathered to actually corroborate and counter-corroborate each other. Thus, we do not only report three separate sources of data, we actually mix them together. This leads us to the third part, which is actually classifying the data, which means that based on our expected out outline, based also on the way we understand, uh, for example, uh, our teams, we will be able to, considering that as our target, we need to break the data into analytic units, break it down to smaller pieces, and thus, based on the smaller bases, categorize them and eventually also thematize them. So that if we have three hours of interview, for example, we try to understand which of in these three hours do we have answers for our statement of problem number one and the dimension under statement problem number one. Uh, dimension A, for example, or B, or C, so that we are clear as to how this whole can in fact be subdivided into smaller units. But once we break it down into smaller units per question, for example, that addresses a particular dimension, we try to rebuild the dimensions again in terms of categorizing the responses from the triangulated source and also thematizing them. So what data analysis strategies can be employed in this process? First, we can identify the themes. Begin with big picture and list themes that emerge. And when you say themes that emerge, that will constitute topics that keeps on repeating themselves. Now, of course, even before you went into an interview, you would have already identified important themes and by means of clarifying concepts, dimensions, and even indicators. To a certain extent, these concepts, dimensions, and indicators should serve as guides in determining the important themes that constitute the big picture. The second attempt is to codi codify qualitative data. How do you reduce data to a manageable form? Often done by writing notes on note cards and sorting these ideas into themes. It is helpful, of course, to actually have a set of questions in mind that responds or inquires into specific dimensions. Thus, when you ask a question based on the dimension identified, you are always already operating on a predetermined category. Again, we've said that though these categories were gathered and identified on the basis of the RRL and therefore will constitute the basic structure in approaching the phenomena or approaching your topic, you need to understand that it should not hinder you in recognizing emerging categories. The emerging categories 
are they ideas, categories that you were not able to consider but have eventually came out as a consequence of your literature review. That too will play a very important role in the study. So when you codify research data, you need to understand that codification will necessitate understanding the data based on predetermined categories as well as emerging ones. So how do we make coding manageable? First, we need to understand that even in the construction of the interview questions, it needs to be clear already what dimension or what section this question is trying to answer. No? It's very important at the very beginning that we are clear about what we are trying to understand. So that the questions, even in the KII or even in the FGD, are already guided by the statement of the problem and the indicators of the statement of the problem. There is a reason why from the very beginning you were encouraged to actually follow the statement of the problem as the outline for your RRL and also the statement of the problem as the outline for your questionnaires. Because that will constitute already an initial outline in coding the text. So what do we do? First, we take note of the questions that we ask and what specific questions and dimension they answer. No? So once we have transcribed all this text, the very first thing we need to do is to make to, to, to transcribe these interview scripts. And upon transcription, we need to photocopy or print out many copies of these interview scripts. Or even right now, that's it's when it's no longer needed to photocopy, we only need to read the manuscripts through our computers. So read through. Read through all the data. And then as you read through, highlight, color code, uh, color code the important ones. Attach working labels to blocks of texts so that you are made clear what the point of that section is. And then cut and paste. Cut and paste blocks on, of text onto index cards or cut and paste blocks onto Word document, class, grouping them together. Group cards that have several la labels together, several themes. And then revisit piles of cards to see if clusters or to see if the dimensions that you have initially identified in your RRL still holds or new clusters will emerge. So another str other strategies would involve, for example, concept mapping, just as when you constructed your conceptual framework and tried to put together or conceptualize your paper, the same is true in this case. We try to create a virtual map of the responses of our respondents following our statements of the problem. So concept mapping will actually allow us to understand analyzing antecedents and consequences, displaying findings, stating what's missing, or recognizing also what's missing. So, for example, in this case of absenteeism, you will have to recognize that uh, the consequence absenteeism can be caused by one, a very poor social, poor, very poor social skills, two, illness, or even three, school safety or bullying. No, a case of bullying. So, 
what do what do we do when we are able to gather all this data already just as there are numerous statistical tests to run for quantitative data there are just as many options also for qualitative data analysis so do not lose heart we can in fact employ many also this session this talk is designed to provide you a step-by-step -step guide for beginning qualitative researchers who want to know how to apply the appropriate strategies for data analysis, interpretation, and reporting. And thank you for listening. If you're interested with talks like this, I suggest you subscribe uh, to my YouTube channel, Samut Sari Sa Simula. And there are also other uh, research techniques there even if most of the time the contents there are actually commentaries of philosophical texts. I hope you're still there. So what do we do with these texts? First, maricondo. No? Uh, like cleaning a closet, think of managing your qualitative analysis process as if you are cleaning your closets. The same basic steps apply. How do you clean your closet? We did say that it's the same process, but how do we do it? First, you take everything out of the closet, bring out everything that you have, which is our way of saying transcribe everything, all your interviews, transcribe everything. Two, Sort everything out. No, Go through everything again the second time. And by going through everything again the second time, we actually, by that we actually mean uh, save or toss. Decide, am I going to save this shirt or toss it? Something like that. Third, look at what you have left and organize. No, After you have decided which one will stay, and which one will not stay, then you can decide how you're going to organize what you have kept. Uh, and how do you do that? By grouping them together, chunking. After you have chunked them together, you organize subgroups into clusters of similar things, several things that belong together clusters and that's when you cluster or that's when you code these similar subgroups as you put things back onto the closet how would you group them to maximize functionality or how do the group makes it work together that's the time when you put it in the cabinet uh, that is very similar to the experience of interpretation as well as presentation. So there are four basic steps, therefore, that you have to consider. One, raw data management or data cleaning. You know? It's possible that you've interviewed a KII, but even if that person is the subject matter expert, you need to understand that uh, He's not just there to answer your questions, but he is there also to tell his stories, anecdotes, or whatever thing that randomly comes. And because you are technically at his mercy or their mercy, you also need to be there and to listen to all the stories and the like. Uh, and in that case, then, you will have to clean the data afterwards in order for you to determine which part of the discourse is worth or has relevance to your paper and which one doesn't have. No? Raw data management. After you have identified the important aspects of the interview or the interviews, that's when you involve yourself in a two-fold or two-level data reduction. That's when you chunk and that's when you code the data. And that will lead you to data interpretation, which is really the process of coding and clustering. Until after you have clustered and grouped them, 
you can now we can now speak of data representation which is really our way of telling the story making sense of the data so that others who are who will read it will also understand what we are talking about so it's very important to also understand that in research whether it is quantitative or whether it is qualitative it's very important that we are in fact operating on the level of still clarifying or still making sense of the data that we have for others so this is what we do in the spiral way no we generate the raw data and after we have interviewed all the people that we say we will interview or after we have gathered all the sources that we say we will gather that's the time we have to organize data. And how do we organize data? By reading through, and that's times two, but actually more than times two, and making notes. By identifying themes, attitudes, behaviors, identifying categories, dimensions, identifying uh, themes and indicators. No? Or we go back to what we often use in class, um, concepts, dimensions and indicators once we have identified themes and dimensions and indicators then we ag ag amalgate amalgamate these themes in order for the concepts to be formed and then based on the amalgamated themes then we can interpret the data in a narrative way when we look at this style of treating data or this style of working with data, we now come to a point wherein we see more clearly or more specifically uh, how the data that we were able to gather are in fact able to answer our statement of the problem. Please take note at this point that we only gather data or we only thematize data, or we even am amalgamate data only in order for us to answer our statement of the problem. Thus, it is safe to say that if the interview section does not answer our statement of the problem, it has to be tossed away. Another way of viewing uh, data analysis is in this way. It begins at the bottom where we begin with data collection, where the interview happens and the like, and therefore begins with the first level, which is the level of organizing the data and managing the data in order for us to read the data, memo the data, reflect the data, write notes about the data, in order for us to describe, classify, and interpret and take into consideration context, categories, and comparisons, mixed matrix trees, matrix trees, propositions, representations, visualization, until we're really able to bring the account out. The procedures are actually on the left side. The outputs and the examples are on the right. So for data managing, that's when you file, you need organize. When you memo, that's when you reflect or write notes. When you describe, classify, and interpret, that's the context, categories, and companions. And when you represent or visualize data, that's when you start writing matrix trees, matrices, and propositions. So take note that by no means uh, are these fixed. They're actually uh, not fixed. No? So let's look at it more closely, uh, step by step, and let's clarify how we are going to move forward from here. So uh, let's begin with uh, let's begin with raw data management. What do we mean by raw data management? No, what is raw data management? So draw data management refers to the process of preparing and organizing raw data into meaningful units and analyses. This will include text or 
audio data that we transform into texts. When we understand it that way, when we understand it that way, we look also at image data transformed into videos, photos, and charts, which can make itself also uh, relevant to the text. So as you review your data, you find that some of it is not usable or relevant to your study. Then it becomes interesting. Let's look at an example. No? Uh, so, for example, look at this text. Uh, it's a raw data example from an interview script. No? I always wanted to get my doctorate, but I never felt I had the time. Then I reached a point in my career where I saw that without the credentials, I would never advance to the types of positions I aspired to. But I doubted I could do the work. I wasn't sure I could go back to school after so much time. And did I have the time with working and a family? These were the things I struggled with as I looked for the right program. Mm, finally, finally starting with a program with others like me, it felt surreal. Surreal. Once you switch gears from being an established administrator at the college to being a doc student, you realize you lose control over your life. You are not in charge in that classroom like you are in your office. But also, once you say you are a doc student, people look at you differently. And people at work began to take me more seriously, ask for my opinion as if I now possess special knowledge because I was going for a doctorate. It was the same information I had shared previously, but somehow it had a special quality. It's like magic. So uh, if that's the transcription of the interview data, then we need to ask ourselves, are some portions of this transcript unusable or irrelevant? No? Then we look at the color purple. Uh, when you look at the color purple, the, the mm, or I can think of a particular example right now, this might not have any relevant uh, contributions to the data that is being pushed forward. Thus, they are cleansed. Uh, which leads us, therefore, to the first reduction. No? So, get a sense of the data holistically. Read it several times. Read it multiple times. This is what we call immersion. No? And if we have immersed ourselves, or when we have immersed ourselves, you'd understand that the immersion process uh, allows us or will give us an overview of all the data that we have. It's very important to see that at this point. So uh, once you have immersed yourself with the data, you need to classify and categorize this data repeatedly, allowing you for deeper immersion into the data. You have to write notes in the margins about these statements. Number the lines. Write notes in the margin. That's called memoing. And after you have memoed or write your notes, then we can look at the preliminary classification schemes that would emerge as we categorize raw data into groups. And that's where we arrive at our first way of reducing data by means of chunking. Yesterday, or last time, I was also telling you the different approaches between quantitative and qualitative research. Data, presentation. I did say that for quantitative research, most of the time, we, we present it in a deductive method, wherein we present first the table and the, and the mean score of the different items that are grouped together. And then eventually, we based on that, 
we we also uh do our best to uh, uh we also do our best to explain it explain quantitative data per indicators and then corroborate it with literature in qualitative research it will follow an inductive model you need to you need to actually cite the specific texts in order for you to be able to clarify what it is that you're interested in. And that's also very important. So in, in reducing data, it is very important to we know data. No? And that's the process of we knowing. This is when you develop an initial sense of usable data and the general categories you will create or you will follow. It is very helpful indeed if you already have an idea about the concept, the dimensions, and the indicators that you expect because that will allow you to really, really identify almost immediately what is usable data and what is not. We also need to look at the preliminary set of codes developed to cluster this raw data into units and share that, especially the units that share similar meanings or qualities. So by then, if we have our RRL to guide us, we would have created the initial code list or even the master code book. Let's look at some chunks or cluster samples. So let's look at these examples. So we were looking at the same interview script. And uh, now we can chunk or cluster. No? For example, we can color code already. And let's look at the side that will say which sections or data are broadly similar. Like we can speak of red for those that spoke about credentials, blue for personal struggles, and green for the shift in identity. So which chunks, therefore, can be clustered together to relate to a broad coding scheme um, is something that we need to ask. But again, no, uh, what we need to take into consideration here is that when you ask already questions on the level of indicators, the possibility that these indicators were act will actually combine uh, will play a very important role in the in the determination of what dimensions uh, are in fact very relevant uh, to your population and sample. So that's really an issue of whether you chunk them or whether you cluster them. So step two, uh, the process of data reduction two. So the process of reducing data from chunks into clusters and codes are very important to make meaning of the data. So it's very important to chunk that chunks of data that are similar begin to lead to initial clusters and coding. Codes here would be refining, developing code books, labeling codes, creating codes through two to three cycles, or clusters here is assigning chunks of similarly labeled data into clusters and assigning preliminary codes. So if you, if you look at it, 
the chunks will turn into clusters, the clusters will turn into codes. That's actually a four levels already if you understand it correctly. So at this point of the codification process, you've already reduced the data into a significant number. Sorry, I have to pause it because I think our neighbor's house is on fire and that's the reason why you can hear uh, fire trucks uh, bustling around, which will also mean if that's really serious, then it's also possible we will lose electricity. We can, I can smell already the, the, uh, the uh, burning pieces or materials uh, from where I am. So, uh, but I hope it's nothing serious as it's very difficult to have a burned house at this point. Anyway, let's continue. So the process of reducing data from chunks into clusters and codes will actually make the data more meaningful. And in that sense, therefore, we will be able to clarify more clearly what the data is about. So what does it entail to do the coding process? Initial coding may include as many as 30 categories. You can, in fact, categorize the questionnaire uh, or the interview script in accordance with the way that uh, that that the indicators were uh, asked. But you reduce the codes once, probably twice, or even five times as if there are five indicators per dimension. And then reduce again and refine to codes that are mutually exclusive and include all raw data that was identified as usable. In qualitative research, because we operate on an inductive model, it's very important to also be able to cite raw data, especially when you are telling the retelling the story all over again. Now, it is in that context that we need to address the difference between a priori or in vivo codes. A priori are codes that are derived from literature or from what we call the theoretical frames. This is the, the framework that you were able to develop and arrive at on the basis of your literature review. In vivo, which also means inductive or grounded, are codes that you are able to derive from the data by using code names drawn from participant codes or interpretation of the data. So what's the difference between the two? So the other one is a preset one, a priori, and therefore the dimensions that you actually work on in the RRL. That's basically what the a priori codes are. In vivo, on the other hand, are actually the codes that you were not able to recognize but somehow came out as a consequence of your interview in the uh, for from the subject matter expert and or focus group discussion it could also be something that has emerged out of document analysis but the point of in vivo is that it's something you have not considered and thus is inductive and grounded like it's like magic is a phrase that could form the basis for a code category, but make sure that the way that uh, that it will depend on how the respondent used the term. Now, coding levels. Uh, there are many types of codes. No, there, it can codes can vary from descriptive to interpretative to pattern coding. And it can it moves from summary to meaning to explanation. Or codes can be open to actual to selective coding, which moves from initial theory to developing relationships between codes towards emerging theory. And that's the reason why in qualitative research, it's possible also that we will also operate beyond 
perceptions. Uh, so, and therefore, we can code from the level of first cycle, second cycle reading, to third cycle coding, moving from describing the data units to actually inferring meaning. So how do we codify these samples uh, in the example that was given at the beginning of this text? Uh, you'd see uh, that we need to take into consideration red for credentials and therefore the codes include career goals, career advancements, uh, the blue for personal struggle codes, and it can include self-doubt, time management. The green for shift in identity codes can include student role, identity at work, shift in control. So you see the codes, CG, CA, SD, TM, SR, IW, SC, which is a mode of identifying the chunks to the code. No, So the chunks, then you cluster, and then you code. Now, coding levels. Descript, uh, we spoke about descriptive to interpretative to pattern coding. In that sense, if that's the way that we code, we move from summary to meaning to explanation. Or we spoke of open to HL to selective coding. No? And therefore, we move from initial theory to developing relationship between codes for emerging theory. And then we have the first cycle to second cycle coding, uh, where we move from describing the data units to actually inferring meaning. So how do we move or how do we do that? No? So here we progress no? from the coding, CGCA, uh, PSD, PG, PWL, IS, ISR, ISC. So uh, here you see from this descriptive, it becomes interpretative. And then we uh, we identify patterns. No, for example, CR uh, needing a doctorate to advance professionally and to meet personal goals for achievement. PG personal struggles evolve to address self doubt about abilities, trying to achieve things before time runs out, balancing responsibilities with family, self, and work. And IS. Managing the shift from student to graduate, from candidate to doctor, from non-expert to expert in work settings, from losing control to regaining control at home and work. So here you see the pattern and also the inductive meaning that is attributed to this pattern. This leads us, therefore, to st stage or step three, where data is now interpreted and teams gathered. So chunks of related data have similar meanings are coded in several cycles. Once coded, those chunks become clustered in similar theme categories, and this will create meaning for those clusters with labels. Themes emerge from those clusters. Now, it is here where the, the conceptual framework that has clearly identified already the dimensions and the themes that you need to pay attention to can actually be improved and developed. And then, based on that, we interpret the themes in order to answer the research questions. So here, uh, let's look at the themes here. No, uh, re uh, how do you compile the cluster into emerging themes? Red for credentials, blue for personal struggles, green for shift in identity. Here you need to begin to see the themes emerge, like getting the degree, becoming a new person. And 
personal achievement. So, how do broad sections emerge into thematic groupings? Uh, let's look at that uh, and pay attention. This will lead us, therefore, to data representation. Uh, data representation uh, includes interpretation or analyzing qualitative data simultaneously. No? And therefore, researchers interpret the data as they read and reread the data, as they categorize and code the data, and also as they inductively develop a thematic analysis. Themes, therefore, become the theory or the story or the narrative. As we've said a while ago, uh, even quantitative data will necessitate a story in order for it to be meaningful, all the more in quant quanti qualitative data. No? What are the different data representation types? Telling the story with drama. No? How do you tell the story with the data? No, sorry, not the drama, but telling the story with the data. Naduling na wala yung glasses ko. So, storytelling, narrative, that's a good way to explain why this is the case and what we have discovered. But also being chronological, describing flashbacks, critical incidents, thematizing, these are all ways of presenting qualitative data. So how will it look in the end? That might be your uh, inter uh, that might be your question. Let's look at how it looked in the end. So here is an excerpt of the interview. Let's read it for you to consider. Uh, this qualitative phenomenological study sought to explore doctoral degree graduates' perception of self, identity, and purpose in the post-dissertation phase, seeking participant perspectives on the phenomena of transition. Considerable research has been conducted on currently enrolled doctoral students relative to the issues of 1. Overcoming obstacles to completing the dissertation. 2. Managing feelings of isolation and disengagement. 3. Successfully completing dissertation research and manuscript preparation. 4. Negotiating relationship with advisors and committee members. And 5. Searching for teaching or scholarship positions after degree completion. Research on the doctoral degree graduate has typically been conducted on individuals in PhD programs where the post-graduation transition is focused on moving into traditional academic roles. Minimal research has been conducted on EDD graduates who are already actively engaged as professionals and or practitioners in their fields and who have also balanced work-life challenges while pursuing their degrees. The issue of personal accomplishment, anxiety, isolation, loss, hopes and aspirations, identity and role clarity, and professional recognition were all examined through the lens of the lived experience of purposefully selected participants all of whom recently graduated from a small EDD program in the Northeast. By integrating the two conceptual frameworks of Nugarten's Adult Development Theory and Lachman and James' Midlife Development Theory, the following themes emerged. You are not the same person. The degree is greater than the sum of its parts. Now what do I do with all this time? And... When will you know, crown me king or queen of the world? These themes reveal the experiences of recent doctoral degree graduates' perception of the transition from doctoral students to graduate students. So that came from the interview script that you've seen. And it is a section, of course. It's not the a totality of it, but that's how it's presented. Amazing, right? So... The second theme, no, the degree is greater than the sum of its parts from candidate to graduate. As one participant stated, the doctoral process is complicated. 
Each individual expressed similar sentiments as they described their first impressions of their coursework and the eventual evolution to dissertation research. As separate parts of the doctoral program, they seemed manageable, but when viewed as a whole program, they seemed overwhelming. The consensus, however, was that each program component informed the next in a way that defied descriptions and prepared them for the dissertation process. As one participant expressed, my understanding of what the degree meant was not clear until I stepped into my defense. I had a moment when I realized that now it all makes sense. So, uh, so there you see, for example, what are the different themes and how these different themes are actually expressed and clarified. Uh, so uh, quant qualitative data analysis types. So what are the different ways of analyzing qualitative data? So most common types of analytic approaches include domain or content, thematic, grounded theory or constant comparative, ethnographic or cultural, metaphorical or hermeneutical, phenomenological, biographical or narrative analysis, case study, mixed method, or focus group. Uh, I'll only emphasize on the thematic because that's what we have been doing in class since time immemorial, thematizing your study. I By teaching you the thematic approach, we've... Uh, we've We've already tried to consider, uh, focused you on the possible outcome of the study. I'm sorry that you're hearing fire trucks around because uh, where I am, in the subdivision where I am, there was a fire. Uh, there's really a fire. And and even everybody, that's why everybody uh, is actually messaging me, uh, my sister and the like. So I'm sorry for that. And that's why you can hear fire trucks ringing until now uh there so i apologies for that sound uh so Okay, let's continue. Oh. So if you are working with a particular research design, the following expert lists can also are provided to help you match specific qualitative research designs with appropriate qualitative data analysis strategies. So these are the experts, the approaches, and the experts just in case you're interested with domain analysis, ethnographic analysis, grounded theory, constant comparison analysis. But uh, the emphasis that I've given is more on the thematic analysis because that's really uh, the one of the most uh, practical way to approach your statement of the problem precisely because we have been thematizing since day one. So... Others will include the linguistic or metaphor analysis and the phenomenological analysis or autobiographical analysis, narrative analysis, case study analysis, mixed method analysis, but never mind. No? So there are also, interestingly, computer softwares that can help you analyze qualitative data. No? Uh, these are software packages that can either assist with theory building or with concept mapping. They also have an attempt to data voice for data voice recognition that converts audio into text, no? such as Dragon and the like. So uh, that's how you analyze qualitative data. Now, data interpretation. Now, let's move to the next phase. So how do you in how do you interpret data? 
uh, how do you interpret data? So answer these four questions. What is important in the data? What questions can be answered out of the data? Why is it important? What can be learned from it? And so what? So remember, interpretation depends largely on the perspective of the researcher. And therefore, we'll have to necessarily answer the question, so what? No? But even if interpretation depends largely on the perspective of the reader, we still need to constantly ask the question, why? No, we need to ask the question, why? One technique for data interpretation is to extend the analysis by raising questions, by connecting findings to personal experiences, by seeking the advice of critical friends, by contextualizing findings in the research, by means of converging evidence, by corroborating claims with other data gathering tool. So it's worth mentioning that though triangulation necessitates the three sources of data, it still needs to be emphasized that at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, we still need to corroborate the evidences. Again, I'd like to reiterate that. Sometimes researchers think that because they're triangulating, the only goal they need to do is to present the data as they gathered it, KII, FGD, document analysis. But that's not true. When you gather the data from KII, FGD, and document analysis, you still need to mix the data with each other in a corroborative and counter-corroborative way so that by mixing all the data together, you are able to converge evidence or identify the appropriate theme. At the end of the day, you present your findings not according to data gathering technique, but according to themes. And that's when it where it becomes or turns into theory. So, how do we ensure the credibility of these findings? Well, we need to ask, are the data based on one's own observation or is it hearsay? Take note, you need to be careful about hearsay. Uh, I always tell my students, hearsays are inadmissible in court. There's a reason why it should be inadmissible in your life also. Oh, ha, who got? Uh, but is there corroboration by others of the observation? Can you validate the observation? In what circumstances was an observation made or even reported? Or how reliable are those providing data? What motivations might have influenced a participant's report or statement or claim and what biases might have influenced how an observation was made or even reported. So how does this work in circumstances where there are mixed methods? So we said last time that mixed methods necessitates the rigor of quantitative research as well as the rigor of qualitative research. So under what circumstances might mixed method work? And under what circumstances might mixed methods not work? And it is along this line that you need to think in terms of epistemological perspectives. What, what are the answers you are expecting 
are these answers answerable in a quantitative way, in a qualitative way, or both? And it's not just a question of whether it can be answered qualitatively or quantitatively, as it is a question of what answer will best saturate what answer saturate is is a good saturation of the data needed to answer the statement of the problem so again no there are there are these two are really different from each other quantitative and qualitative so you look at the quantitative method uh, there's a preference for precise hypotheses uh, stated at the outset. There's the preference for precise definitions, uh, data reduced to numerical scores, much attention to assessing and improving reliability of scores, assessment of validity through a variety of procedures with reliance on statistical indices, preference for random techniques for obtaining, meaning, obtaining meaningful samples, preference for precisely describing procedures, preference for design of, or statistical control of extraneous variables, preference for specific design control for procedural bias, preference for statistically summary, statistical summary of results, preference for breaking down complex phenomena into specific way parts of, for analysis, and willingness to manipulate aspects, situations, or conditions in studying complex phenomena. You can compare that with the qualitative methodologies, which has preference for hypotheses that emerge as study develops, preference for definitions in context or as study progresses, preference for narrative description, preference for assuming that reliability of inferences is adequate, assessment of validity through cross-checking sources of information or triangulation there, uh, validity through cross-checking of sources or triangulation. Uh, preference for expert informant samples or SME, purposive samplings. Preference for narrative or literary descriptions of procedures. Preference for logical analysis in controlling or accounting for extraneous variables. Primary reliance on researcher to deal with procedural bias. Preference for narrative summary of results. Preference for holistic description of complex phenomena. And also the unwillingness to tamper with naturally occurring phenomena. So this, these two are really two totally different uh, animals. And uh, this table you can find from Frank for we can find in the book by Franken and Wallen also. So in mixed research, no, uh, mixed res mixed methods research is a style of research that uses procedures for conducting research that are typically applied in both quantitative and qualitative studies. The purpose of this design is to build upon the synergy and strength that exists between quantitative and qualitative methods in order to more fully understand the given phenomena that is possible using either quantitative or qualitative methods alone. So the cue that you need to pay attention in this definition uh, is the fact that uh, you implement the synergy in order to, for you to more fully understand the phenomenon. Uh, and that too uh, justifies the usage of the mixed method. No? So... When you implement a mixed method, then uh, you will have to take into consideration three characteristics that are different in itself. One, uh, in a mixed method, you have to identify the priority that is given either to quantitative or qualitative data and the sequence of collecting quantitative or qualitative data, as well, of course, as the technique and how you will evaluate, put together or mix together the quantitative and qualitative data, whether you combine them in the analysis or you keep the two separate, uh, will play a very important role. Thus, in quantitative, in this mode of doing research, we either identify quali quanti, quanti quali, or both. No, what is the design? No. Uh, so, in Many of you, for example, you need to understand that your 
panelists might be coming from a quantitative perspective and therefore will demand that you uh you imp implement a frequency in count in the qualification of the data so it's okay it's not wrong uh but you also need to understand what the repercussion of that is no so because you're already operating on a mixed method technique once you start quantifying your interview codes no so there are 10 characteristics of the mixed method the researcher describes the kind of mixed method being used that's very important the purpose statement or the research questions indicates the type of methods being used the data collection section indicates the narrative numerical or both types of data that are being collected and you put that of course in the data analysis section and questions are stated and described for both quantitative and qualitative resource approaches further the researcher indicates the sequencing of the collecting qualitative and or quantitative data in a mixed method. Is it quantitative versus qualitative? Is it qualitative versus quantitative? Or is it equally quanti quali? The researcher describes both quantitative and qualitative data. And the writing is balanced in terms of these approaches. No? Uh, There are eight questions that can help us evaluate the mixed method design, just in case you will implement them, which are, does the study use at least one quantitative and one qualitative research? Does the study include the rationale for using a mixed method? Does the study include the classification of the types of mixed method design? And does the study describe the priority given to quantitative and qualitative data collection and the sequence of their use? Uh, was the study feasible given the amount of data to be collected and the concomitant issues of resources, time, and expertise? Does the study include both quantitative and qualitative research questions? And does the study clearly identify qualitative and quantitative data collection techniques? Does the study use appropriate data analysis techniques for the type of mixed method designs that will be involved? So there are many things that you have to consider. Uh, but uh, as we said last time, it's very important to take note also of how these are, how these will all put together or help the study. Uh, Bryman, uh, but the more important thing, I will insist, uh, and uh, here it's very important that you're with me, that you thematize the study. So based on the interview transcripts that you're able to gather, you are now going to thematize the scripts. Uh, carefully. And by doing so, uh, see things very well. So in thematic analysis, please take note how you need to do it. You need to read the text as a whole. You need to read and mark the text for emerging keywords or codes. You need to code the text and group the codes to themes. And you have to relate the themes to the different data gathering sources and to literature. No? There's a PowerPoint, uh, uh, there's a YouTube channel here. Uh, there are two. So uh, I'll just send the PowerPoint also uh, in order for you to be able to capture these two. Coding. No? So how do we basically code data? No? Let's look at this example that you have in front of you. So let's look at the question. Uh, so for example, no, this is also another example. Uh, what 
in this course has helped you the most? And then your response is, and let's look at the response. I appreciate how much the instructor encourages us to voice our opinions and to ask questions in class. As much as possible, he took the time to respond to everyone's questions and opinions, to explain concepts, and then to make sure everyone understood his answers. This helped me because I felt like I was being heard and I became more involved in the learning material. In the initial coding, these are the things that came out. Encouraging expression of viewpoint, encouraging questions, responded to questions, explained content, checked for understanding, student feels valued, student feels involved in own learning. And then in the focused coding, it becomes encouraging student participation, presentation of content, and student empowerment. So see how, how from single lines you can in fact draw uh, responses, themes, uh, along, along clearly identified dimensions. No? Um, that's a very, very simple uh, sentence, few sentences, no? three sentences only, but you can imagine the beauty of the codes that came out also. So when you analyze large quantity of data, you can actually use an app called NVivo, but uh, but please learn it on your own because it will entail uh, different uh, skills to be able to do that. No, so now, how do you ensure rigor when you analyze? Uh, So here, the notion of trustworthiness rather than validity and reliability is very important. Uh, as such, you need to know the data very well. Listen, read, reread. Those are very important. Uh, aspects. So, and here is where we see the iterative process. Uh, how do codes link with literature? How do these literature link with the research questions? These are the things uh, that you need to take into consideration. These are also the instance where you have to be explicit about your own biases or positionality. Uh, and how this affect your interpretation you also this will also be the instance where you cross check themes with others and therefore analyzing the same data so you need to be careful about your statements because you might be over exaggerating it you need to be able to display a sense of uh distance with your study so that so that you are not uh, obviously overemphasizing certain things. So what are the necessary personal attributes when you code? Uh, according to Saldana, uh, you have to be organized. You have to persevere because it's not going to be easy. You need to be able to deal with ambiguity. Uh, you need to be flexible. Uh, you need to be creative. You need to be rigorously ethical. You need to be extensive in your vocabulary. And that's where you need to understand how these attributes will play a very important role. Now, coding uh, really is a way of focusing data. No? Uh, and 
And therefore, that's where you will realize the role of the codes, the place of the categories, and also the themes. No? So these are very important dimensions that you need to take into consideration. Uh, so from the interview scripts, you identify the codes. From the codes, you identify the categories. From the categories, you identify the themes. So, and then from the themes, that's where you draw theory. Uh, theorizing is not always the goal of, uh, of some researchers. Sometimes the goal is just to provide, to identify challenges that will provide interventions. And that too is very important in understanding the research process. So, so again, no codes is more often a word, a short phrase that symbolically assigns uh, a summative, salient, essence capturing, and or evocative attribute for a portion of language based on visual data. Uh, so that will include a label, therefore, that captures the essence of a small portion of content. Uh, so uh, an example, for example, is this statement. Well, if you are not familiar with the internet, there is a couple of people who are just not comfortable with it. They are just not going to use it. No? Um, if you look at this example, the typical, the topic coding here is about technology use. Uh, but also the evaluation coding would imply opposition. And then the in vivo coding will, will refer to uh, not comfortable or not being comfortable. No? So that's just one sentence, but you can identify a topic code, an evaluation code, and an in vivo code. Now, Code is also about linking, no? Uh, so there's a very huge, there's a paragraph uh, beside, we can look at it uh, and I'll, allow me to read it for you. I think really when I was analyzing it, there is technology for research, there's technology for collaboration, and there's technology for use in the classroom personally. I didn't really get why we were having all this exposure and really kind of quickly to some of these other technological things, you know. And I don't think, quite honestly, I haven't done a lot of practice with it. I did the Eric things to get my research and the wiki and the delicious, but I haven't really seen how it is going to benefit the completion of this particular project at this point. And then the interview would, would interview we would say, do you have anything specific, specifically that the technologists help with in terms of the work for this class? And then the respondent would say, I would say specifically the use of the ERIC and the library portal for this class specifically has been helpful. And then have you guys done much in terms of email back and forth? Then it would say our group has done email and we have used attaching our drafts and collaborating in our notes and communicating with each other about have you tried this? Have you tried that? That sort of thing just to kind of touch base and make sure we are on the same page. So there you can look at the different notes there from collaboration, personal use. I don't get it too quick uh, to practice. Eric, Wiki, Del E, I C shoes, uh, no benefit. Uh, and then Eric library again. Uh, and then uh, email, collaborating, communicating, touching base. Those are all pertaining to personal use. But uh, Eric and the rest are very specific softwares also. Uh, and you can see also technology there uh, being emphasized over and over again. So uh, how do we begin processing this one? No, So uh, then you can focus on your 
purpose statement. What is the purpose statement? No? Uh, think about philosophical orientations like metaphysics. Well, you can ignore this one because this is a little bit complicated. But re-examining your paradigmatic approach is important. Your narrative, how you will say it. And then start making reflexivity memos about it. No? So always remember uh, that uh, this is moving from description to interpretation. No? So when you have live stories, then the approach used is more narrative. If you're interested about commonality of lived experience, culture, text, theory development, systems, and things like that, archival data, uh, this all pertains to a very specific approach that is used. Uh, but the same is true for interpretation. No? If your goal is to solve problems, to understand power and relationships, to develop subjective meaning of experiences, how the social world operates, and scientific verification. So, so the 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 uh, the the environment that qualitative data can operate can be very wide but all that i suggest is that you just focus on the codification and uh, on answering your statement of the problem so how to do this with paper now from the beginning keep a coding notebook Transcribe all observations, interviews, and memos. Reread your transcripts. Write quick memos as they come to mind. Do pre-coding. So what do you code? In the beginning, learning what does not need to be coded happens by coding everything. No? So you code everything. Some say that minutia can provide insight. So... Everything can provide insight, code everything, codify everything. So, uh, so what do you need to ask when you code? What are people doing? What are they trying to say? How exactly do they do this? What specific means or strategies they use? How do members talk about, characterize, and understand what is going on? That's uh, yeah, uh, I was talking about the dynamics and power relations in an FGD. Is there a person that choose, decides to overtake and things like that? Uh, uh, what do I see going on here? What did I learn from these notes? Why did I include them? These are questions you need to pay attention to also. No? Uh, and they're very important to consider. Saldanya would ask, what surprised me to track your opinions, to track your assumptions also? So what intrigued me to track your positionality or what disturbed me to track the tensions within your value, attitudes, and even belief systems. No? These two are very important questions. Uh, so... In the first cycle coding then, the initial coding of the data corpus is done in a way that makes sense of your study. We've said that. Saldana lists 24 possible first cycle coding methods in seven categories. Let's look at some. No, So for example, attribute coding descriptive data about the setting. Like, well, if you are not familiar with the internet, there's a couple of people who are just not comfortable with it. They are just not going to use it. No, that's a 47-year-old special education teacher uh, at the fifth week of the course ED555. No? Uh, take note also of the magnitude coding or ordinal evaluation or responses. No, So you take note 
of the attitude toward technology, uh, the use of positive, neutral, or negative, or the negative attitude. No? Um, and then you can do subcoding, no? like technology use, discomfort, and structural coding, no? interest in using technology in research work, uh that's basically it uh and then descriptive coding nouns that describes the topic best no internet in vivo coding just not comfortable process coding refusing worrying about skills that's also using gerunds emotion coding like stubbornness that can be done also so uh some first cycle coding types will include attributes describing data about the setting, magnitude, ordinal evaluation of responses, subcoding, second order tags, structural coding, predetermined research topics, descriptive coding, nouns that describe topics, in vivo respondents' words, process coding, gerunds, Emotion or emotions recalled or inferred. Those two, those are also possible coding types. Here, you will probably need to multi multiple methods simultaneously, but try to carry whatever you choose all the way through. Consistency. You may need to do first cycle coding more than once. In fact, I suggest five times to make it clear. Second cycle coding will include reorganization of the first cycle codes in order to identify categories, themes, and theories. Uh, those are very important also. No? Uh, and of course, the elimination uh, of marginal or redundant codes. So some second uh, cycle coding types would include patterns, uh, identifying units of analysis, themes, uh, focused, which means identifying codes occurring most frequently, and axial, which is identifying dimensions of a category. Uh, so coding approaches will therefore mean uh, you need to read everything and make notes of any potential themes that may come to mind where you also have to read until a possible theme appears and then follow it through all of the data. Code every sentence or piece of sentence and then recode into categories. And then try to pick a single coding strategy and follow it through all the data. Those are the coding techniques uh, that you need to take into consideration. Uh, this leads me to ask uh, where we are so far no? uh, in the research process. Uh, so let's situate uh, what you've been learning right now and today in relation to the things that you've learned and that we've learned in the past few sessions. So uh, again, we've been looking at the background of the study and we've said that the background of the study should create the need for the study. Aside from creating the need for the study, as we have said, this should actually preempt for the readers, the begging of the question, which will happen on the, uh, which will be stated in the general statement 
of the problem. Now, we said that the general statement of the problem should actually be uh, the whole and the specific statements of the problem should be the part. But that the general statement of the problem is answered only when the specific statements of the problem is answered. The suggestions are many, but we can focus on questions that describes, questions that evaluates, and questions that prescribes. Of course, there are many models uh, of research, but uh, this is the one that's uh, the easy for our purposes. We did say that these will have to correspond to your RRL, and therefore you need to be able to look for literature that actually describes, uh, evaluates, that will help you describe, evaluate, and even prescribe uh, in relation to the dimensions that you need to pay attention to. The RRL, as you, we have said, uh, will become the basis for what we call your concepts, uh, the dimensions of the study, as well as the indicators uh, of the study. Uh, of course, uh, the determination of these concepts, dimensions, and indicators will have something to do, the indicators will have something to do, uh, is the one that will have something to do with the type of research, whether it is quantitative or qualitative or mixed method. Uh, but also the indicators is the one that will actually make itself in the instrumentation uh, of the work. And the instrumentation uh, will vary, of course, in terms of quantitative and qualitative. Now, what we have seen so far is the degree of uh, that in the chapters preceding at least the laying down of the body of the text, there is a greater and greater specificity or detail. Now, at this level, this specificity will change uh, as it will actually move, as we move now to present the findings of the study. Uh, of course, the findings of the study will still depend on the research problems. The, the research problems will be the basis for the presentation of the uh, findings of the study. And that's the reason why uh, very close to the RRL, in fact, one that will almost replicate the RRL, uh, we will see, therefore, uh, again, the responses that should be described, that describes... Uh, evaluates and prescribes. No? And it is these that we need to pay attention to as we move forward. So uh, so so how do we arrive at this level? No? Uh, we did explain that when you have your interview script, you have to transcribe the, the interview script. Actually, uh, sometimes I don't even ask the officer to transcribe it anymore. But you have to listen to it multiple times. And as you listen to it, you need to take note uh, of the statements that are significant or important. And therefore, there you memo uh, or there you actually chunk together uh, the statements that make sense. You have to cluster them together. And then here, what you cluster is eventually what you code and that what you code, you thematize. And, and the process of memoying, clustering, chunking, clustering, coding, thematizing is a multiple uh, system that has to be repeated over and over again. I, For purposes of addressing questions about quantitative processes, I will just post the uh, a few notes about this one, which you can also read if that is the direction that you want to take in your study. Thank you very much for paying attention and have a nice day.